Ephesians 4, and we are verse 26. All right, Ephesians 4, 26. Everybody's favorite verse. Be ye angry, and let's end it right there. <laughs> Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Somebody said this. I don't know who this is. Phyllis Diller. Doesn't mean anything to me. Okay. Oh, okay. She says this. Never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. <laughs> many people don't understand this verse because they think anger is always wrong there's a place for anger biblical godly uh, just anger at sin in psalm 7 verse 11 the bible says this god judgeth the righteous and god is angry with the wicked every day Hmm. Well, now, we do realize there are some things God can do that we can't. <laughs> you may enter into just a small snippet of it, but basically, anything that has to do with self, you want to stay away from. But if you're angry for God's behalf at wickedness, then that's okay. There's two types of anger in the Bible. The anger of man, of course, that's the one you want to stay away from. James 1, verse 19. James 1, 19. It says, Where, uh, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay, this is giving you the idea that you could enter into some wrath, just don't do it hastily. And that's the way you can kind of tell when you're heading toward the wrong kind of anger, is it comes on you like that. That's something built up in the nature of man that just starts to take over. Okay, you want to put that one down. Now, it's different if you're slow to wrath. You've planned this thing out. The next time I see this sinful situation, God, you've said this and this about it. Remind me, I'm going to bring that forward and I'm going to let them know how offended I am for God. Okay, well, that's, that's legitimate. Verse 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So question yourself the next time you choose to get angry. And that's what it is. It is a choice. When you choose to get angry, is it going to work the righteousness of God? That's, that's a good way to judge it. Man's wrath just in human nature is wrong. We know that. That's flesh. That's selfish reasoning. Um, the Lord's anger, of course, is godly because he can do nothing but something godly. He can be angry. Matter of fact, he says, I'm angry with the wicked all day long. And I can, we can't really, that concept kind of escapes us. If we were totally holy, we wouldn't even like the Christians. <laughs> I mean, really. If you were totally holy like God, you wouldn't even like yourself. Amen. Right. <laughs> now, Jesus Christ in us is the only way we get by this thing. And that's good. Um, look at Ephesians, Ephesians 4, verse 31. Ephesians 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Whew, that's a list right there. Right in the middle of that list is anger. He said, that's a bad one. Make sure you put that one away. Slide that in the drawer somewhere and lock the door. <laughs> the anger of God. Let's look at that one. Uh, in Ephesians 4.26, he told us there that we could be angry and sin not. Okay, there's some possibility there. We saw that God is angry with the wicked, okay, but we're not God. We better be careful that we don't try to play him. <laughs> this anger towards sin and unrighteousness is a good thing. Now, here's the way this thing usually works out. The righteous anger that is usually okay is when you're angry at your own sin. Yes. That's a good one to have. Yes, That's a righteous anger. Amen. It will work the righteousness of God. Yes. Look at Joel chapter 2. 
Joel 2, verse 13. He says, And rend your heart, and not your garments. That is not an outward show. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Okay. He could be... I mean... He has just cause to be angry at us the second we open our eyes in the morning. But it says, no, he puts that thing on slow. He puts it on simmer. <laughs> He's slow to anger. And of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. That's great. That you have confidence in God because you know he doesn't smack you down the second you do something wrong. I mean, he should. But he doesn't. He gives us a space to repent. That's gracious. That's the God we serve. Look at Jonah chapter 4. Jonah 4 verse 2. Here's the backslidden prophet. <laughs> God says, go to Nineveh and preach to them. Yeah, that's the country that's threatening to take over the Assyrians. But I want you to go preach to them. Uh he says, Jonah 4, verse 2. Jonah's mad about this. God has actually gotten a great result from Jonah's preaching. The whole town repented. Jonah said, that's not what I wanted. Jonah 4, verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? <laughs> Therefore I fled before thee unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Look who's mad now. <laughs> Jonah's the one mad at God. Because God didn't get angry when he thought he should have. Hmm. That's a good thing. He would have been wiping Jonah off the face of the earth. Because <laughs> Jonah was being just like us. Stubborn, letting the flesh win. Nahum, Nahum chapter 1. Nahum 1 verse 3. Nahum 1 verse 3. It says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Rarely do you see those two coupled together. Somebody who's great in power usually exercises it. Nonstop. Uh, I, somewhere I heard somebody say, the evidence of great power is the restraint right. of that power. Whew. Think about that. Just because you could do something, if you choose not to, that shows your power. I'll tell you another good one. The young people nowadays need to learn this one. Anybody can cuss. That's not hard. I'll tell you what's difficult. Can you speak without cursing? Can you use your mind to come up with a vocabulary word to express what you're feeling? Okay, just to sling out words that are perceived to be powerful that don't even fit the sentence. What kind of power is that? <laughs> okay. I said that to adults. Yeah, adults. I said, yeah. I said, I, I asked God. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and he thought about that, and you know what? That guy quit cussing. Good. He quit cussing because mm. he got under so much conviction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stuff. The problem is, all of this cursing has turned man's mind to mush. Yeah. They don't know how to think. They can't. They've got a feeling in there, an emotion. And they've heard everybody else use these words to express it. And so they think that's going to tell me what they're thinking. That doesn't tell me what you're thinking. You don't, if I were to give a definition of your word, it would not fit the sentence. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay, and they're. also fun of that too is that people don't read anymore. That's true. So yep. they don't have a book Yeah, they don't know how to read. Need to get hooked on phonics. I can't read real well, but. <laughs> it, the fact of the matter is this. God is slow to anger. He's long-suffering. 
But long comes to an end. There's a day his restraint will be over. Now that's a scary time. It's a fact though. Look at Genesis 6. See historically when that happened. Genesis 6 verse 3. Genesis 6 verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with a man. Just because I've been slow to anger doesn't mean I'm always going to be slow. For that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in a hundred and twenty years. Hmm. Verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Okay, that tells you the heart of God. Look at those verses. Anytime God mentions, uh, uh, the heart is mentioned in a sentence with God in it. Find out what God thinks and how he feels. We don't think about that. We're so selfish we don't. But we should. He says right here, their sinning has grieved me. You know what grief is? It's when something happens beyond your control and you sympathize. You hurt for it. God says this sin that they're doing down there, they're choosing to do it, and I've made a way of escape, and they won't look at it. Now Noah, of course, had made it out all right. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. I think he's mad. <laughs> Both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made uh, them. God says, I'm mad, I'm done. Wiping them out. You know, fortunately, Noah p helped repopulate this globe. <laughs> when sin was put on Jesus Christ at the cross, the wrath of God fell on him. Therefore, it does not have to fall on anybody else, unless they choose it. And many do. Look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 6. Great prophetic passage here. I'm going to do a 180 on this passage and make everybody put their thinking cap on. <laughs> this has to be prophecy. You know it's talking about Jesus Christ. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is a fact. Now the spiritual application is this. You sinned, God created you, you didn't create yourself. Your allegiance should be to him. When you sinned, there was no way out except for God said, I'll pour it out on Jesus Christ. And that'll be your way of escape. Now, that's a spiritual application. I've rarely heard anybody ever, I don't know that I ever have heard anybody, give you the doctrinal side of this. So I'm going to cover that. Before you were saved, were you a sheep? I'll make you fishers of sheep? No. Fishers of men. You were a fish that got turned into a sheep. <laughs> so what's Isaiah saying here? There were some sheep that went astray. That's the nation of Israel. So they had God as their father, as a nation. And when they went astray and turned their back on God, this applies to the nation. Now, it won't be appropriated to the nation until the millennium. I'm sure glad that God made us the public display for Israel to get jealous over. <laughs> That's why we're here. Look at uh, Mark. Mark 3, verse 1. Mark 3, verse 1. This is Jesus Christ going into the synagogue where all the spiritual people are. <laughs> and he entered again in the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the hypocrites, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might have to accuse him. And he said unto the man uh, which had the withered hand, Stretch, uh, stand forth. And he said unto him, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? 
but they held their peace. <laughs> I guess so. He just laid it out. Here's a black and white choice. Should I heal the man or do some evil? I mean, there's no middle ground in that. <laughs> Verse 5. And when he looked around about on them with, what's that word? Anger. He's saying this because he's fed up with their hypocrisy. He says, y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. You're not even worried about the man. You're worried about some made-up rule. And it was not God's law that they, they were worried about Jesus breaking. It was their own made-up rule. Being grieved, there's that grieved again. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He said unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. This is Jesus getting mad. And that's just the way it is. I know that people want to view the Godhead as some effeminate, always peaceful and doing whatever you want. But that's not literal. That's not biblical. Look at John chapter 2. John 2. John 2. We'll pick it up in verse 15. This is Jesus going into the temple and realizing they've turned what was supposed to be a spiritual event into business. You know, like most churches you walk into. <laughs> it's a business center with the facade of religion on front of it. Verse 15. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. The lawyers ought to be threatening over that. That was not your money. I would, you owe us reparations. <laughs> Verse 16. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. He was eat up with anger. He was mad. Sure was. So there is biblical uh, precedent for godly anger. Now, we've got to be very careful in displaying anger towards somebody else. I'll tell you, you can. it's a safe bet that you can find enough things wrong with yourself Amen. to have plenty of time to pour out that anger right there. <laughs> and you won't need, if you'll pour enough anger on your own sin, chances are you'll be a little more merciful to somebody else's. <laughs> you are too tired, that's right. <laughs> this, wasn't just a, this, this, this wasn't just about 20 people he ran out of. Yeah, Those he emptied the place. That's right. A lot of growth uh -huh. out. Yeah, and... He's turning over all of their money. It, could you imagine this? A Jew losing his money? <laughs> they must have been scared to death of him. You don't part a Jew from a dollar bill. But he did. <laughs> and the cattle and all the merchandise, it's gone. Now, I'm going to show you this is an important thing. It must be important because the fake versions change it. Here's, here's what it says in the NIV. I should have got the other perversions out for you, but... Here's what it says in the NIV, in Matthew 5.22. Matthew, you can turn there, Matthew 5.22. Matthew 5.22. In fact, I need to pull that up myself. People love the chapter, or uh, yeah, chapter 5 in Matthew. Remember, this is the Beatitudes, what people call the Beatitudes. And... They think it's all sweet and nice, but it's not so much. They, they've not read very much of it if they think it is. There's some harsh stuff in here. Matthew 5, our verse is verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say uh, to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. And that's literal in the millennium. Hell will be visible. There will be opening to it. And they'll toss them right in if you fail that judgment. Matthew 5.22 in the NIV says this. But I tell you that anyone 
who is angry with his brother or sister, now we've got to make it feminine, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his sister, rock, brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. It just says anybody who's angry with his brother or sister is in danger of the judgment. Was Jesus Christ? Was God? He's angry every day with the wicked? Okay, they've just condemned God and Jesus Christ. By taking out the phrase that's supposed to be in there, without a cause, there's righteousness that is a cause. In the English Standard Version, ESV, that's become a popular one. It says, but I say unto you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Same thing. They don't want you to think that there's a cause that justifies anger. There are some causes. In the New American Standard, that's an older one, that's a Catholic version. But I say unto you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court. Same thing. They take the cause out of there. As though there is no reason a person, even at wickedness, should get angry. You should get angry at wickedness. However, it shouldn't become your life. Our verse said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Okay, so even at the end of the day, if you're mad about um, the, the predators out there and the wickedness that's all over this world, the political corruptness, okay, get you some righteous indignation. Enjoy that for a little while. <laughs> but then by the time you go to bed, don't be dwelling on that. Turn that over to God. He's big enough to handle it. And guess what? He'll be up all night. <laughs> you don't have to be. Give it to him. <laughs> get you some rest. <laughs> let's, uh, let's find out. I got more here. Let's skip some of this. Matthew 4, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 28. Ephesians 4, verse 28. It says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's a problem nowadays. You can't find anybody who wants to work. <laughs> and the few who are money hungry don't want to labor doing the thing that is good. They want to sell some drugs. They want to find a get-rich-quick scheme. How about just get in there, get, get a little sweat going, <laughs> manual labor? <laughs> That's gone. He says right here, that'll keep you from stealing. But it's not just the manual labor that somebody who uh, has a tendency toward taking something that doesn't belong to them. It's not just that. What you need to do is you need to dedicate that labor to doing it for somebody else. So there's no selfishness involved in it. Hmm. Labor so that you can have to give to somebody. I got a friend of mine who was telling me that he's opening up some clothing line. And his goal is to give 90% or 80% of the profits to missions. That's I don't know how you can make a living doing that. But if God blesses it, he can. <laughs> that's good. Okay, that's laboring with a purpose. Here he's saying that's a good thing. If you want to get out of whatever sin has entrapped you, go to the Bible and find out how God says to do it. He doesn't just say stop. He says replace. Here, if you're a stealer, don't be a stealer. Be a giver. Good thing to do. Obviously, if you're saved, you should not be stealing. <laughs> I mean, we all know that. And you would think you wouldn't need to write that. But guess what? If he didn't put that in here, all the Christian would run around saying, well, it's not spelled out in black and white, so what? Okay, he put it there. <laughs> Some of the simple stuff in the Bible you think, now why would God have to put that in there? He doesn't have to, but it's to keep you honest. Mm. Look at Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14, verse 23. Proverbs 14, 23. This verse right here will keep you from being a telemarketer. <laughs> Proverbs 14, verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. <laughs> you want to be poor? 
Get a job just running your mouth. <laughs> okay, he says in all labor there's profit. Have you ever done a job and you didn't make anything on it? Or you lost money on it? Sure, but you still made profit. You learn not to ever do that again. <laughs> the Bible's true. There's always a lesson you can learn. There's always a way to enrich yourself by getting out and doing what God says to do. It's man's job to work. Mm. There's coming a day we won't have to worry about working as being a drag. I mean, let's face it, our bodies get wore out quick. The older you get, the quicker it gets. <laughs> but there's coming a day in the millennium where it's, that's the, the Sabbath rest, a thousand years rest. Now we'll be ruling and reigning, so we'll still be working. But we'll have a glorified body, it won't be work. Look at Luke chapter 19. Oh, absolutely. It's good to profit other people. You know, mm -hmm. like sometimes you're yep. going to lose. It's good to think profit all the time because it's going to benefit somebody else. You pick it up a piece of trash so nobody else has to do it. Yep. Luke 19, verse 8. This is Zacchaeus, the wee little man. <laughs> and uh, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods... I give to the poor and he's not being real honest here if I have taken anything from any man by false accusations he knew he had I restore him fourfold <laughs> yes he had but at least he's willing to do something about it okay that's good the sign of true repentance is not just a change of mind it's trying to make it good. If you stole something and you get right, you go take it back. According to the Old Testament, you do it fourfold. You realize that it needs to cost me something. Just returning it isn't good enough. That would be insurance. I need to return it and I need to suffer for it. <laughs> I mean, that's the real idea behind true repentance. Look at Acts chapter 20. Acts 20 verse 35. Acts 20 verse 35. The problem in America is this. There are many, many people in need. In real need. I don't have a problem with the welfare system. I think it's a good program if it's used correctly that's the problem you find so many people trying to take advantage they don't need it the bible cuts through all that garbage acts 20 verse 35 i have shown you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the lord jesus how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive now that's not just given to the bum who's not going to do anything, given to enable somebody to just sit on the couch and do nothing. It's given to the weak, those that can't get out there and earn it. Uh, I don't think I put it in here. He talks about uh, supporting the widows indeed. And then he goes through and explains what a widow indeed is. Okay, they need some support. The Bible says it's our job to support them. Hmm. A lot of times, I think we'll get to heaven and find out how often it happens. A lot of times, God gives us money and he's got it earmarked for another place. And I wonder how many times we get so stingy, we say, no, I'm going to hold on to this one. Ooh, I'm afraid we're going to find out. Uh, I can't remember who it was. Somebody said, God will always give more through you than he will give to you. And that's a fact. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2. Paul has come through and he's told these people, hey, look, there's some great needs out there. And he's telling this to a bunch of poor people. <laughs> he said, we've got some saints out there and they're in bad shape. We're going to pass the bucket. Everybody toss in everything you can. <laughs> but he's preaching to poor people. Poor people are more giving than rich people usually. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty 
abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That is, they were givers. Even though they themselves had great poverty. Hmm. You know what that does? It earns you something. You can't outgive God's what they say. Well, that's just a catchphrase, but the sentiment behind it is true. When God wants you to give something, if you will do it, you're giving it to Him, not to where it goes. I remember when we were in Bible school. I was rich in Bible school because I had a job at FedEx. Now, when we first moved down, I was not. Even though I had a job at FedEx, <laughs> I was part-time. I was making $300 a week. No, a month. Yeah, I can't remember. I was making exactly what our monthly rent was. <laughs> we we would walk to walk to uh, McDonald's, and they had a deal back then, an all American thing. It was ninety nine cents, and we would split that. That was our splurge on the weekend. <laughs> but then soon I got promoted, got full time again, and everything was great and grand, and I had stock and all kinds of stuff. So I would give to any place I could find, and you know, when I had opportunity, I'd do it. And then I gave to somebody sometime, and then I found her out there eating, eating out, and living it up. And and in me was like, how dare they? And then the thought just hit me. Wait a minute, you didn't give that to them, you gave that to God. Don't worry about what they're doing. And that's fact. If you give, just give it to God. He might be testing you by making them do something you think is out of character. <laughs> Look at uh, 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 18. 1 Timothy 6, 18. Paul's telling Timothy, here's what you need to do to be a preacher. <laughs> he didn't just let him go out there and do whatever he wanted. You know, the Bible's a book of instruction. It's unfortunate, but we don't just automatically do the right things or know the right things to do. We have to get some instruction. 1 Timothy 6, 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Now, this good, he said, this is something that a preacher should be preaching. Okay, I know the world preaches this from a sinful standpoint. They love humanitarians. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> Talk about some corrupt garbage. That's what that is. And the world will exalt that as though it means something. It means nothing. However, if you'll do good and be rid in good works and ready to distribute, with that comes something. See the last phrase? Willing to communicate. Look at the communications of a Christian giving versus the Bill and Melinda Gates communication. <laughs> Big difference. When you give, that's an opportunity. It's an open door to open your mouth. You know, if you're helping somebody, you suddenly have a right to say something you didn't otherwise. They'll listen to that. Yeah, I mean, it may not stick with them. They may not do anything with it, but you've got an opportunity that you wouldn't have other places. Sometimes, now, I've gotten soft in my old age. A lot of times I give to these bums that ask for it. <laughs> I give them a little something, you know. But sometimes I'll do this. I'll put, i say, look, I don't just give away money. I pay for workers. If you'll work, I'll give you some money. Here's $10. I'm going to put it in this track. If you'll read this track, you can have the $10. And give it to, now, I've paid them. I've paid them to read a track. <laughs> That's a good thing to do. It's doing good, distributing, and willing to communicate. That's all three of them. Find a way to do it. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29. Here's a cursing verse. <laughs> a verse against cursing. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Okay, so corrupt communication is something that cannot minister grace to the hearer. That covers a whole lot more than just cursing, doesn't it? Mm. What is grace? 
Well, the most basic definition of grace, you find it, I think I've showed you before, in, in uh, Exodus, the grace is Jesus Christ. He is the mercy of God. That's grace. Okay, if it doesn't exalt Jesus Christ, the communication's probably corrupt. Mm. Okay, now, of course, it does have to do with cursing. Obviously, corrupt communication. Talking about things that you have no business talking about. Okay, he's writing this to Christians. Why would he have to write this to Christians? Because we're just as wicked as the lost world if we let ourselves go that way. <laughs> Can't you define communicating as um, doing something for somebody as well? Absolutely, yeah. But you can be corrupt in that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're, dis if you're, for instance, the verse that just came before it was about distributing, giving to those that need. Okay, you could do that with a selfish motive behind it. And that's corrupt. You should never give anybody anything. Now, I'm not going to put a period on that. <laughs> you should never of yourself give anybody anything. You should always give it to God through a person. So you can, a lot of times you just ask him, God, do you want them to have this? How much? <laughs> Both pockets, really? <laughs> That doesn't mean much in my pocket. That's about 50 cents. <laughs> James chapter 3. James 3 verse 1. James 3 verse 1. Brethren, my brethren. So this is Christians. Of course, James is not writing to Christians, but we're going to spiritualize it. My brethren, be not many masters knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, all of us think we're masters. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you get down to it. You think you know better than me on something. And you, every one of us think we have a, a superior knowledge in some area than whoever else we're talking to. Okay, so in some regard, we think we have mastered something. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Don't, don't think that's bad. You know, we're supposed to strive for the mastery. Okay, so you should have mastered some biblical things. So he says here, Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Ooh, that's proclaiming yourself a master. That's running out there with the cap that says master on it. Master chief. <laughs> okay, we don't want to do that because he says, I'm going to judge that one harder. Verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be great, and are driven in fierce winds, yet are they turned about with very small helm. Whithersoever uh, the governor listeth. That, that is, one little man sitting up in the, the pilot's house, can turn this little wheel and this great big old ship in the tough winds and waves. I look at those things right now. We've got ships stacked up all over the nation waiting to get in. I look at those things and I think, man, I don't know how they make it across the sea, you know, from China and from Europe and all those places. Some of those seas get to be four stories tall. And that boat is massive with those big old huge uh, railroad c container cars on it. And those waves are going like this and that. And those boats just come right through. He says they control it with a little bitty helm. That rudder takes care of it. He says that rudder for a man is your tongue, verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. <laughs> Okay, so if you want to start purging sin and cleaning your life up, here's a great place to start. Amen. Look in the mirror and stick your tongue out. <laughs> That's iniquity right there. It's a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. You could tap into hell real quick just by allowing your nature to take over. 
Mm. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and of birds and serpents and of things of the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is, un, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now, I've got news for you. God can tame it. Matter of fact, if you're saved, he's already tamed it by you being saved because he killed it. <laughs> you're dead. The part of you that's dead is your flesh and your tongue's connected to the flesh. That's not a spiritual part. It's a physical part. Now, the problem is a lot of times that dead body has the, you know, when you kill something and it still moves around. I remember the first time, I got to get back to preaching in a minute, but I'll, I'll take this little side break. When I first... <laughs> When I first went squirrel hunting, my dad bought me, you know, my first gun, my first shotgun was a 410. That's really not much more than a BB gun. Uh, but we went out there squirrel hunting, and I shot this squirrel, and it comes down, and, you know, I'm all excited about it. We go over there, and I don't want to pick it up because the thing's still moving, and it's making noises and everything. It's like, yeah, it's moving. He just walks over there nonchalant, give me a gun. He smacks it with the butt of the gun. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's what our body does. It keeps twitching and moving, and that tongue wants to talk. Don't let that tongue get away. It's dead. Smack it with the butt of the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, verse 3. Ephesians 5, verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Imagine connecting those things. But that's what he did. He said fornication and uncleanness or covetousness. We wouldn't equate those as the same. But he says they're on the same plane. Let it not once be named among you as becometh saints. Okay, so a lot of saints don't become saints. I don't mean they don't turn into saints I mean they don't act like they are and that's easy uh, it's easy to slip into the grave and let the old man just play around however a saint should act like a saint something different than dead people uh, look at verse uh, f uh, 4 verse 4 neither filthiness nor foolish talking <laughs> he's connected that with the sins of the flesh filthiness or foolish talking that is talking about foolishness. Now there's a place for joking. There's a place for fun. However, if that is your focus in life, it's just foolish. It has no point. Even a joke should have a point. It should be there to prove some uh, bigger truth. He says, nor jesting. That is just, you know, comedy hour which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Okay, there's that replacement thing again. Um, if you're given to any of those things on that list, a good way to overcome them is thankfulness. Hmm. It's amazing to go through. I need to do it sometime. I guess I will the next time I go through the Bible. Do this. When you go through the Bible, find the replacements God puts in there. He puts them in there all over the place. And he'll say, if you're given to this, do this. Don't do this, do this. There's always the do this. Rarely do you hear Christians preach about the do this. They love to preach about the don't do this. Because you can swing your finger pretty hard with the don't do this. <laughs> it's not so easy to swing that finger when you're saying do this. <laughs> but the two go hand in hand. Okay, we better cut it off there. Yeah, we've been an hour. Uh, we'll pick up next week at Ephesians 4, verse 30.